Dean, Prorector, professorial colleagues, students, friends. It is a rare privilege for me uh, to be here and to have a chance to say a few words on this um, happy occasion. And I, uh, as I listen to the ceremony and watch the uh, titles of the dissertations being displayed and the learned a little bit about the traditions of this university in maritime trade, the economics of transportation, and reflected on my chosen topic, which is pragmatism in economics, I began to feel quite comfortable that I was amongst friends and that I had come uh, very much to the right place. I came here in the company of Professor Zegos Kolodko, a friend, a statesman, an apostle of what he calls the new pragmatism. And since this is a perspective that we share, and one on which I was raised by my own father, also an economist, as you've just heard, and someone whose work was published uh, in Poland 50, 40 years ago and widely read here, I thought I would devote my remarks today to this topic. Pragmatism is a philosophical term which originated in the United States in the 1870s. Um, and it grew from two important roots. One was the scientific materialism that emerged along with the work of Charles Darwin. And the other, perhaps more important in the American context, was the victory of industrial power and military professionalism in the American Civil War in the 1860s. It was an age associated intellectually with such names as Charles Saunders Pierce, William James, later in the 20th century, John Dewey, an age that favored experiment and experience over ideology, doctrine, and faith. The greatest of the American economists, in my view, and was uh, a man of Norwegian extraction, Thorstein Veblen, who distinguished a fundamental social division between the ceremonial occupations, government, the priesthood, the professorate, uh, sports, and war, and the industrial or productive activity guided by engineers and conducted by men and women, and especially by women, uh, who were imbued with an instinct of workmanship and the orderly cause and effect mental discipline of the machine the production line, the production process, and I might add, uh, in the tradition of this university of the transportation system. Perhaps roughly the division between those of us on stage and those of you who are coming here to study. It was, in its essence, a tribute, Veblen's work, was to the essential scientific sensibility uh, to the preeminence of practical knowledge. Now, in my profession, and particularly in the United States, practical knowledge is not at the core of much of what passes for economics. Such concepts, even as supply and demand, anciently rooted in the classical Chinese notion of celestial harmony, perfect competition, equilibrium, and so forth. These are idealizations, abstractions in service of a political ideology, the general preference for markets, free markets, and capitalism over socialism is a strong part of it. And while this has its importance, it is substantially a sectarian and doctrinal dispute. Pragmatism says instead, that one should focus on problems and learn about how to solve them, work toward their solution in the world as it is. In the American experience, 
the quintessential pragmatist was the pragmatic era, was that of Franklin Roosevelt and of the New Deal, launched in 1933. It was also the starting point of my own father's career. He was born in 1908, which now seems like an awfully long time ago. Uh, but his career began in Washington in 1933. Roosevelt faced an ecological catastrophe, the Dust Bowl. The New Deal planted a billion trees across America. The American South had been impoverished, destitute since the Civil War, seven decades. The New Deal brought electrification and industry to that region. 25% of American workers were unemployed in 1933. The New Deal brought them jobs and in, in uh, jobs programs and in public construction. Roads, a million kilometers were paved. Tunnels, bridges, dams, airfields, more than a thousand of them. Schools in every rural uh, location in America, courthouses, museums. Social insurance, social security was invented to protect the elderly. The bankrupt banks were closed. Those that could be saved were reorganized. Banker uh, depositors, deposits were insured for the first time. This new system was not capitalism and it was not socialism. It was simply those things that seemed to work to deal with the problems that the country faced at the time. My father came to economics from a farm. He, was, he never studied a higher mathematics or foreign languages. And I think his interest in the classical economists did not emerge until substantially later in his life. He wrote his early work, actually for a local newspaper in Canada, on how to get tuberculosis out of the cows. He wrote, as a graduate student, on bees, apiculture, honeybees, the industry, and on budgets of local governments. And when he finally came, when he came to work for the government, his first assignments were on things like where to put the ammunition factories for the coming war. He was in Washington the weekend of Pearl Harbor, and he was the first to recognize the immediate consequence, which was the need to ban the sale of rubber tires in order to preserve that strategic resource as the Empire of Japan marched toward Malaya. For a year, he had control in a supposedly capitalist economy of every price and every wage in America. Made him very unpopular. I asked him where he found 17,000 people whom he hired to administer price control. He said, land grant colleges, places like this. He said, I hired all of the economics professors. He was also, in the post-war period, an essential architect of the return to self-government in Germany. And he was actually the first, maybe not the most influential, but the first to see the necessity and to propose the Marshall, what became the Marshall Plan. His study of the effects of strategic bombing in that war led him directly decades later into the leadership of the opposition to the American war in Vietnam as an exercise in destructive futility, a matter on which he advised Kennedy. And as ambassador to India, he worked uh, with the Polish uh, leadership, the delegation to the, inter to the uh, International Control Commission to attempt to achieve a negotiated settlement and stave off uh, the disaster that was clearly in view. This was a man who had practical knowledge and who applied it in practical ways. 
When my friend Professor Kolodko came into responsibility in this country 26 years ago, he took a similar approach. The debt accumulated in the previous regime could not be paid. He worked out how to write it down. Where a policy known sometimes as shock therapy had damaged Polish society, he acted case by case to repair the damage. Where institutions were needed, he worked to build them. Where enduring pillars of culture needed support, he found ways to provide it. The Polish success, which has now endured for three decades as one of the remarkable stories of post-socialist Europe, owes a great deal, in my judgment, to the practical and pragmatic frame of mind exhibited by the leaders of Polish society at critical junctures in this period. I might add, and I don't wish to speak about my own career, uh, that at the time, as you've heard, I was acting in a role as an advisor to the government of China. Another rather prominent example of the pragmatic approach to economic decision making, I consider that my role was primarily to keep them away from certain ideological figures. But the Chinese have some expressions which are worth bearing in mind. They say, you seek truth from facts and you cross the river by feeling for the stones. This is the expression, I think, of a creed that is worth bearing in mind. And so, dear students, the tasks ahead will fall to you. You will not find the answers in your textbooks. You will not find them in formulas. You will not find them in the simple-minded or the relatively simple uh, application of mathematics uh, to problems, although it is certainly the case that an understanding of math and statistics and the evidence will help you on your way. Look instead to the world around you. Frame your best understanding of the massive problems that we face and look for the path forward that can make progress against those problems in a practical and effective way. In particular, the climate crisis, my generation's unpleasant bequest to your generation, will require by far the largest coordinated effort of planning, regulation, investment, and social transformation ever attempted by human society and it will require that it be done on the scale of the planet as a whole. This is a task which cannot be entrusted to magic. It cannot be expected to be performed for us by incantations to markets or to any other, to governments for that matter, to any other uh, institution or formula beyond what you yourselves are capable of imagining and bringing into action. It will require a new pragmatism to underpin what is sometimes called a Green New Deal. A Green New Deal which should draw some inspiration from the comprehensive innovation and pragmatic spirit of the original New Deal, its approach to take up problems one at a time as they come forward and to find the best way to address them. The practical spirit of Franklin Roosevelt, of my father, John Kenneth Galbraith, and of Jegos Kolodko. Let me therefore urge you toward practical knowledge 
including history, law, and politics. These are indispensable to understand how to place your engineering and your technical knowledge, your knowledge of biology and physics and of applied science to work in the modern world. And let me leave you with the words, which I'm going to paraphrase in just one respect, of our country's greatest pragmatist, a man whose pragmatism existed before the word was actually brought into common use. The President of the United States during the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln, who understood that there was only one practical way to win that war at its darkest moments in 1862, and that was to emancipate the slaves because he understood this was not something you did simply because it was the right thing to do, although it was, but because it would change the military balance and bring about the emancipation of the slaves. And the slaves brought in to the struggle in this way would do it themselves, as indeed they did. And in his message to the United States Congress uh, at the end of 1862, Lincoln closed with the following words. The dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. The occasion is piled high with difficulty and we must rise to the occasion. As our case is new, we must think anew and act anew. We must disenthrall ourselves, and then we shall save our planet. I changed just one word. Lincoln said country. I say planet because that's the task which your generation will have to undertake. And I'm very, against again, pleased and honored to be here to welcome you uh, to this university where you will be, no doubt, assisted in the most capable way to acquire the knowledge, the skills, and the courage, and the determination to make your contribution toward that goal. So thank you very much indeed. <laughs>